University here on BBC4 in an hour's time this evening. But first, some strong language as we explore the fear factor and its effect on the eyewitness. Many of us will be a witness to a violent crime at least once in our lifetime. The police will require us to give a statement, accurately recalling the event and describing the perpetrators in detail. But it won't be easy, because our memory plays tricks on us. I want you to tell me everything that you can remember that happened. Which is why eyewitness accounts can't always be reliable. Previously on Eyewitness, our ten unsuspecting volunteers believing they were taking part in a program about memory became crucial witnesses to a staged murder. Under questioning, their statements proved what police and psychologists have known for some time. Human memory is fallible. And he slapped her. We make poor eyewitnesses because we cannot accurately remember what we see. So we inadvertently make up details, filling in the gaps to make sense of it all. The guy like, in the high-vis jacket was just standing over this other guy kicking him. You might knock him out! Tonight, why we can't take eyewitness identification at face value. I think he was wearing sunglasses. As one of our volunteers is kidnapped at gunpoint, what effect does fear have on the witness's memories? And what do they choose to focus on? Six weeks after witnessing a fatal pub stabbing, we brought our volunteers back to take part in a photo identification experiment. In the studio, we placed ten photographs, three of which are the actors from the pub fight. The murderer, Gordon, his accomplice, Jimmy, and the victim, Dean. The remaining faces were of a selection of males completely unknown to our witnesses. We then asked them to identify any individuals they recognized and which part they played in the crime. Number six, he was the one who was wearing the high-vis jacket. Seven witnesses picked out Jimmy as the rude man in the high-visibility jacket although most were confused as to the exact role he played in the crime. Surprisingly, no one identified Gordon as the murderer. In fact, only one witness placed him in the pub at the time of the crime. I think number one, he was just around the pub. I recognise number four. Number ten looks familiar, but I don't know why. I think number seven was the chap who was just jumping about. It's very difficult to say. Number two. I'm pretty sure number two. But most shocking of all was the two witnesses identified the same innocent man. A man they could never have seen before as the murderer. Misidentification was one of the main reasons for establishing the English Court of Criminal Appeal in 1907. But it wasn't until the 1970s that the legal system truly recognized the fallibility of eyewitness testimony. In 1974, Laszlo Virag walked free from prison with a royal pardon. He had been sent down for 10 years because eight eyewitnesses had positively identified him as the armed robber who had shot and injured a police officer. Such was the credibility of eyewitness testimony at the time that no other evidence was put forward by the prosecution. Famous for taking numerous cases to the Court of Appeal is defence barrister Michael Mansfield. Identification evidence by eyewitness is highly fallible, frail, fragile and has to be treated with great caution. It's powerful to have somebody who was there who can recreate the emotion and the sequence of events and so on. However, at the end of the day, although that's a very powerful witness, it can be seductive and it can be misleading. Uh, I do think jurors now are much more aware of the dangers of hanging on the every word of an eyewitness. 
As potential jurors and eyewitnesses, how do we fare at recalling a stranger? To find out, we sent our researcher who is Southern Irish, six feet two with brown hair and hazel eyes to stop and ask for directions. Excuse me, excuse me, do you know the way to the train station? Once out of sight, could people describe him? How old do you think he was? His middle twenties. 42? 35. I would say bluish grey eyes. Green maybe? Blue. I would have said hazel. Six foot eight? About five nine. Excuse me, do you know where the train station is? Foreign accent by the sounds of it. Eastern European from his accent. It's a bit like a librarian. And what about his hair? Ginger. People tend to be very bad at describing strangers, and there are several reasons for that. By definition, a stranger is someone we're not familiar with. We haven't seen them very often. We might be only seen them once for a brief amount of time. So we won't have a particularly good memory of what they look like. We then find it very difficult to imagine in a specific face, to bring a specific face from memory into our mind's eye. Once it's there, we also then find it very difficult to describe. We simply don't have the language to start describing in any detail what an individual feature looks like. Which is a problem for police, as they have always relied on verbal descriptions from witnesses to find unknown suspects. He is 36 years of age, Five feet, ten inches. Once, it was all they had to go on. Dressed in a dark grey suit, black shoes and grey trilby hat. Understanding the importance of turning verbal descriptions back into visual ones, police brought in artists to generate a suspect's likeness. But they not only relied on accurate descriptions, but also on the skill of the artist. Technology in the 60s brought an identikit and photo fit, which comprised of albums of individual features the witness had to piece together into a face. There are lots of problems with this. Uh, it's got lots of lines on it, and the features don't necessarily kind of match up particularly well. The other problem is really a psychological one, in that what you're asking the witness to do is to go through and construct a face feature by feature to look through albums of eyes and go, it's those eyes, it's that nose. And that's an incredibly difficult task for us to do because we don't represent faces in our memory as a collection of features. We represent the whole face. If seeing all the features together is key to recognizing a face, would our powers of recognition be affected? if we relocated those features into a new face shape. To find out, we took photographs of our volunteers and transplanted their internal features into different faces. We put our brand new hybrid faces in with a mixture of manipulated celebrities and people whose features had not been touched. Strangers our volunteers couldn't possibly know. We then asked them one by one to pick out any face they recognised. Nick didn't put a sticker on his own face. He actually looked at the picture um, and disregarded it. You would think, unless he never looks in the mirror, that his own face would certainly be one he was very familiar with. I thought, there can't be anyone I know. So I thought, I'll just walk past. It seems that recognising a face might be much more than just the eyes, nose and mouth. One of the things about that picture is it's got lots of hair, and of course Edward doesn't have much hair. Hair is the most salient feature for Caucasians. Changing hair changes the way the whole face looks, so it might be quite difficult here for Edward to spot his own features. When I looked at it at first, I thought, there's something familiar about him. But I thought, no, it's a fellow who died ten years ago. I mean, it's a bit of a cheat that I put in there, but I've never had it like that. Never in my life. The face shape that Simon internal features have been placed in is quite dissimilar from his own, so that when he looks at it, it's very unlikely he will see anything familiar because he's not seeing his own features, he's seeing a completely new face. I walked past it, just didn't look like me at all. If we can't recognise ourselves, 
Are we any better at recognizing famous faces? Of the five celebrities, they recognized Oprah Winfrey and Wayne Rooney more than the others. One reason for this could be that they're more familiar with those two people. That's because you see a lot of those two people in the news and in newspapers. Whilst we are pretty good at spotting celebrity faces, we also rather worryingly think we recognize total strangers. The photograph that Rosetta just stuck a sticker on uh, is one chosen by lots of people. One interesting thing is she's smiling. It's almost like that photograph was taken of her when she was looking at someone that she knew. So when you look at her, you kind of get the sense that she knows you. And that sense of familiarity comes really coming through in her expression. The odds on our volunteers providing the police with useful identifications are lengthening. The problem is that we're just not that great at recognizing even our own faces if there's anything out of place. This person looks slightly familiar, but I didn't really associate the picture with myself. But now that you've said yes, I can actually see that, that bit there. <laughs> And we're certainly not the most reliable when it comes to recalling new faces. And what about his hair? Fair uh, brownish. I can't remember. <laughs> he didn't even notice his hair. I think he had a cap on, didn't he? In an ideal world, our eyewitnesses would have flawless recall and perfect recognition. Because they will need to recall the events and perpetrators of the crime, and later identify the suspects in custody. But as we've seen in the chaos and confusion of last week's violent crime, the witness statements were often confused and contradictory. If you went like that, there was no punching or anything going on. It was just one guy on top of the other one rolling around. And the other two guys just got up and ran out of the pub. He didn't run. And sometimes just wrong. This person was actually actively using a knife. Just like having to see a whole face in order to recognize it. We need to see a whole event to make sense of it. When we don't, our brains will subconsciously fill in the gaps with whatever makes most sense, whether or not it's right or wrong. Did you ever see a knife? No. Did not see a knife. Did you ever see any weapon? Did not at all, no. The brain is not a camera, and you see what you want to see and everybody sees a situation completely differently. As we saw last time, knowing for certain who or what someone has or hasn't seen is the fundamental problem with eyewitness testimony. Because all the police have to go on is what witnesses say they saw. Now, for the first time ever, we'll be able to see exactly what eyewitnesses do look at during a crime thanks to these eye tracker glasses. They're one of the most advanced tools in market research and track precisely where the wearer is looking. You can see those numbers on the wall, aren't they? It's gonna ask you to look at those one through to five in sequence. With only five pairs of eye trackers available in the UK, only half our witnesses can wear them. Graham, Simon, Rosetta, Andrew, and Swarthy's glasses are calibrated to ensure their eye movements are successfully tracked. Okay. And to test the system. Hi everyone, my name is Laura London. We put on a show. What are you looking at? I'm trying not to look there. <laughs> oh, I'm just looking all over. <laughs> Watching a magic trick allows our witnesses to get used to wearing the glasses and enables us to see exactly where their attention is focused. Are you ready? wherever that may be. <laughs> I've got a 10p and a 2p in my hand. I can see you're all watching very closely. If I take the 2p and I've placed it inside my bag, what do I have left in my hand? 10p, of course. I still have the 10p and the 2p. We'll try that again. As the magician uses an array of distraction techniques designed to cause confusion, our volunteers must decide where to look and what to take in, just as they would when witnessing a crime. I actually have nothing. Magic over. Let's put their recall to the test. Was she doing magic there? Hey? Was she doing magic there? <laughs> While Haley and Nick are asked to stay behind at the studio, the remaining volunteers believe they are being bussed into town on an exercise they will be tested on later involving market research. 
Must, must look like a right bunch of prats. <laughs> Let's see the front. What is with these umbrellas? All got a lady's umbrella. But we're planning a very different test. Dulce guy. One that will reveal what witnesses focus on during a crime. How fear affects memory. And just how difficult it is to identify suspects. The witnesses will only get one chance to spot the perpetrators. All except our plant Liz, who unbeknownst to the other volunteers is an actress. She's been secretly rehearsing with the cast to ensure everything goes to plan. Can't be scared. Today she will be kidnapped in a bungled robbery. Need a pair of welly boots. It's rainy. And that could affect our eye trackers. We've got see-through umbrellas, isn't it? A final test for all the equipment ensures we capture every reaction. Are we supposed to follow you, Robin? Oh. Are we supposed to be looking at stuff? I've just been staring at your ass. <laughs> As in real life, this crime will be over very quickly. I'm just looking at everything. I'm not looking at anything, actually. I'm just walking. Oh, am I supposed to be looking? Our volunteers are seconds away from witnessing the crime yet oblivious to what awaits them around the corner. Having previously interviewed our volunteers as witnesses to the pub murder, Greater Manchester Police, experts in witness interviewing techniques, are treating this crime as real. Please do not discuss what you've just seen. This time they will interview our witnesses concentrating on identification of suspects. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. While the witnesses are taken to the station for questioning, this is what really happened. As the security guard went to the back of the van to get the money, an armed robber jumps out and threatens the security van driver. Get me out! Free your hands! Don't move! While the second robber demands the box. Give me the box! Don't Put tell me what to do! Give me the box! The third robber keeps a lookout. The security guard with the cash box knocks the gun from the robber's hand. And in the scuffle, removes his balaclava. The robber panics and looks directly at the witnesses. The first robber floors the security guard with the money. The third robber spots Liz, our actress, phoning for help and grabs her. He fires a shot. Don't look at me now! Come on! At the same time, the other two robbers cut the chain to the cash box. The silver Audi reverses towards the robbers, and the driver jumps out. The robber, who has hold of Liz, pushes her into the car. The others get in. The car speeds off. The action lasted just over a minute. We have allowed the police to arrest two suspects, but they're not talking. And without the use of forensics, the police have no idea what role the perpetrators played in the crime. Gathering accurate eyewitness statements is crucial 
if identifications are to be made. Actress Liz, now recovering from her kidnap ordeal, reflects on what her fellow volunteers' reactions might be to this second crime. I think everybody is probably more aware this time around that something might happen, but I don't think they were expecting what, uh, what did happen. And I think ultimately, um, ultimately they'd be going, oh, what's going on? Oh, this is a setup. But then when I got involved and I started screaming and shouting, and that probably shut them up at a thought, and they were like, oh my God, is this serious then? The investigation will be led by Detective Sergeant Mick Comfrey and Force Specialist Interview Advisor Ian Hines. Shortly after two o'clock today, there was an incident at the rear of a company called PRP, Wholesale Diamond Merchants. But the major issue, time-wise, so that you're fully in the picture, is that we've got uh, two in custody at Bootle Street, so the clock's ticking and we've got things we need to address with some urgency. We need to know, the suspect interview teams need to know who's done what, basically, of these two. So primarily the SIO topic is descriptions of offenders. Carol, I'd like you to work with Wendy, and I'd like you to interview a witness by the name of Andrew Smart. In Manchester, most interviews with key eyewitnesses to a serious violent crime are recorded on audio tape and DVD. Two trained officers are allocated to each witness. My name's Carol Barlow. I'm a detective sergeant here in Manchester. And you've met Wendy Haslam, who's the other police officer who's next door. While one carries out the interview, the other watches from outside ensuring nothing is missed. Tell me everything that you saw from start to finish. Yeah. Don't leave anything out. Because... Although the priority is identification of suspects, as always, the cognitive interview starts with uninterrupted free recall. There was about 10, ten of us and we came across a, a robbery. There was a, a man wearing a balaclava and trying to uh, get the the case. Disappointingly, Andrew's eye tracker camera hasn't worked. There was a bit of a commotion with the first masked man and the security man actually pulled his balaclava off. But he seems to be giving a pretty accurate account of the event. The third um, masked man had a gun. One of our group, Liz, he grabbed her, fired the gun. It was a silver Audi and they took Liz as well in the car. And he has noticed something unusual about one of the robbers. What you're telling me is uh, there's three robbers. Masked robbers, yeah. Three robbers. I'm sure one of them was a female, because it sounded like a female voice. If it's the female, it was the second one. We put the security man on the floor. I'm not 100% with that. <laughs> Try and capture a really good image of this second person. Okay. It would draw me to saying, female and because I've got this this female voice I don't know what what they'd said or anything but I've got this female voice on my head so all right Carol we're just going to do a comparison chart for the witnesses so let's deal with your number three first the one who fires the shot in the air all, all the right. details you can give me five foot ten the police set up a board in order to pull out all the corroborative points so they can build a picture of what happened and who did what Loads of people have seen his face, he says, oh, shit. Any tone of voice? Can't say. No accent, no distinguishable accent. With two suspects in custody, it's crucial to obtain detailed descriptions as quickly as possible. I can only hold them for 24 hours before I've got to apply to keep them longer, firstly, to a superintendent. So I've got witnesses to interview. I need to identify the suspects. I need to balance the job of getting the witness testimony against the clock that's ticking for the people in custody. So we've got to keep moving and get the information that we need. This two men trying to rob this security van. I spot a guy sort of leaning on the bonnet of the van, pointing his gun. From there, one of the men grabs one of the group, Liz, fires his gun into the air. The car appears. One of the guys drags Liz off. They get in the back seat and they speed off and they turn left at the bottom of the street and that's the last we see of it. 
Graham's recollection of events seems to jump from the very beginning of the crime to the end where Liz is grabbed. Completely missing out the struggle between two robbers and the security guard. Yet his eye tracker camera reveals that he spent half the time looking at the robbery before he focused on the robber who had Liz. I want you to try and think about the moment that you've got the best view of the guy who grabbed Liz. <laughs> he was sort of average build, if not a bit stockier. Height, 5'10", 5'11". Not small and not tall. OK. And that's it. That's it, really. Right, OK, so let's try something different then to kind of help you out. As Andrea tries an alternative approach to retrieve more detail from Graham, it becomes apparent why his recall is so patchy. I did look at the gun quite a lot, weirdly. Yeah. Do you know why you did that? Because he was... he was had hold of someone that I knew. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I was looking at, really, like, what's he going to do? Yeah. When That's I first saw the guns, yeah. Yeah. I thought, they're not real guns. Because right, okay. they look, didn't look real at all. And that's when I papped myself when he fired it, because yeah. oh, it is real. Yeah. Um, so... What Graham is displaying there is what I would class as weapon focus. Uh, it's quite common when people are witnessing a violent crime. And he's keeping an eye on that weapon because it's obviously a threat and it can do him harm. He wants to know where it is, where it's pointing, and more importantly, is it pointing at him? What uh, makes you think it was a sawn-off shotgun? It looked like it had been altered. Right. And that's where I'm getting sawn off shotgun from. If someone you know is involved in that, you th all you're thinking about is how can you stop that happening? And the, the sort of general crime and trying to look at what was going on is just secondary to all of that, and I think that's why I didn't remember it. Rosetta, like Graham, had a clear view of the robbery, but also seems to have been affected by the gun. The person with the gun moved towards us, shouting, get back, get back, get back. I was a bit scared at this point, so I sort of moved myself back to the back of the crowd, if you know what I mean. Although Rosetta doesn't look at the gun directly, it's clearly had an impact on her memory. I believe it was a blue car. It might have been a Volkswagen, he bungled her in this car and they drove off. What more could you describe of the car? Not very much, mm. because I just remember panicked when mm. she, she got pulled and they bungled her in this car. I just was a bit petrified by mm. this point. Fear affects people in different ways. The trauma and experience of seeing a violent crime take place can completely eradicate any memory a person has of that event. You may well think that they should have a great recall of what went on, but the absolute fear that they've gone through, it's almost as though it's just erased it from the memory. I don't know what his face looked like, I don't know what his hair looked like, I don't know how tall he was. I just know that I can see that figure there mm -hmm. in lighter clothing whether it was blue, grey, mm. off-white, to me it's probably something like what you're wearing now, what I can remember. And Rosetta's no better at describing the unmasked robber. I'm sure he had one of those protective kind of helmet thing on, didn't he? Mm. But then it had, he had dark hair coming down the side. Now, just to clarify, this man, we're not talking about the security guard, am I? Was it the security mm. person or was it the accomplice? Not sure. Mm. But if I was to see that face again, I would remember. What she did was used some of her memory of what the security guard looked like to describe the unmasked robber. Now, that's perfectly understandable because she was experiencing a lot of anxiety and we know that fear can have a very negative effect indeed on memory and it can certainly confuse memories together. When the gunshot sounded, 
that just displaced a lot of what I had because it was a bit of a shock. I did not expect that. And the way I responded to it, it's as if, oh my God, I'm sure quite a lot of things left my memory and that gunshot, the sound of it remained. So, I don't know. So far, the police haven't got much to go on. Will Simon give them a new lead? Uh, a car came into the street that I was in from the other direction. It reversed in. His eye tracker shows no car reversed in. And out of the car jumped, I think, two guys, possibly three guys. No. The driver of the secure core van, I think he was actually in the van, and they actually pulled him out of the van. Uh, no. What Simon is doing is trying to make sense of the crime by describing what must have happened. The car must have pulled up at some point, so he's filling in the gaps. He's saying he saw something that happened because it makes sense to him, though he never did see it. Simon's eye tracker shows that he concentrated almost exclusively on the robbery, with only a fleeting glance at the robber who had hold of Liz. Leave everything else to one side and just... Fight. But he goes on to describe him in extraordinary detail. Mm. I want you to tell me everything you can remember about him. I think he was wearing sunglasses. Pretty sure he was wearing sunglasses. He actually, one of the things, he actually shouted, you know, don't, don't look, don't look, don't look at me. And, you know, he was standing there with a the shotgun, so <laughs> I kind of like didn't look at him. <laughs> but what I remember is that I'm pretty sure he was wearing sunglasses. Mm -hmm. I certainly don't remember his facial features, which might suggest that he had some kind of cover over his face. Because I think he had a hat on as well. I think he had a peak cap on. Simon only looked at the face long enough to appreciate that the eye region was different to the rest of the face. The eyes are revealed in two patches. So if you look very briefly at her face and you just saw these two patches, you might interpret that as someone wearing sunglasses. He's filling in the gaps. He's introducing inaccurate information. Sunglasses. Yeah, he had sunglasses on. You know the type of uh, sunglasses, like a... Um, like a Ray-Ban style sunglasses. It's like a, a silver rim, thin silver rim. Quite, you know, big. They're not sort of like small, quite large. So they cover quite a big part of your eyes, you know. And, and black lenses, you know, really dark lenses. I've got some sunglasses which are, tint, which are just kind of like tinted brown. These are definitely black lenses. So you really can't see through them. You can't see the eyes through them. That's what I'm seeing. I'm seeing these glasses. The glasses, silver rimmed, black lens. That you, you refer to them, I believe, as Ray Ban. This incident was pretty quick. It was also like, it was really unexpected. Simon seems to have forgotten what he remembered. Any shots fired from the car? Because I think I was trying to remember so much that I couldn't remember what they were wearing really very well. I couldn't remember not very much detail. It was more about what happened rather than what they looked like. Do you know what I mean? The eye tracker results are very revealing, as I think they tell us what psychologists and the police have known for some time that what witnesses say they saw and what they actually did see can be two very different things. Will Swarthy's recall be any more accurate than the other witnesses? Actually, I went back and I made notes. Is that something I should use or not? Well, if you wouldn't mind just leaving your notes for now, and would you mind putting them in your bag, okay. or and this will just go off what you remember okay. at this time? Okay. Is that okay? That's fine. We can't prove that those notes were actually swathers. She could have um, spoken to other witnesses, and her version could have been contaminated to some degree. So the safest option is to get that first recall. I don't know how this happened exactly, but um, there were two guys in the scene the first guy hit the other guy's hand and hence you know the revolver fell out of his hand there was a scuffle between the three men and then the third guy actually fired a shot in the air it was really really scared Liz I could see that Swarthy's eye tracker confirms her recall her focus constantly moves around the crime scene from the robbery to the kidnap the getaway car and the driver but what does she actually remember seeing when there was a scuffle between the three men, the first guy, he actually pulled one of these guys' masks off. That guy was quite scared because he held his face and said, my face, my face. I think they were all white men. 
I don't think any of them were African or um, Asian or anything like that. So what can you tell me about Man Wan? He was dark-haired um, and I think he had slightly... How should I put it? Eastern looks, maybe he was from the Middle East or Southern Europe or something like that, you know, slightly darker looks. I was actually going to ask you what it was that made you think he was Middle East, more Middle Eastern. Colouring in terms of his hair colour, that, that's what I meant. Uh, I don't think he was necessarily um, dark or tanned or anything like that. He was, he was definitely white as well. I mean, he's, he's not really... Uh, okay, how can he be Middle Eastern as well as white? I'm just... He was definitely a white guy, I think, but he had features which were slightly more Middle Eastern. That's what I'm saying. I'm not saying that he's a guy from the Middle East. Witnesses struggle tremendously when it comes to the description of faces. An additional dynamic that adds to that difficulty is the ethnic background of an individual. The colour of the skin can be very, very difficult to describe. What an investigator will sometimes do is invite the person to consider a famous face for instance somebody from TV to try and assist them in identifying as near as possible the color of a person's skin and the description how do the other witnesses describe the unmasked robber um, he had short black hair tight tight weave you know, the afro Caribbean, I don't think he was an Afro-Caribbean. But he was definitely had light brown skin. He was dark skinned, but not um, not black. I would say he was. Uh, he looked maybe Asian, Indian. I'd say slightly lighter than Tiger Woods. Uh, yeah. Can you think of anybody with a similar skin tone? Ashley Cole. Ashley Cole. Yeah. Footballer. Yeah. Kind of mixed, mixed kind of more. mixed like Mediterranean. -y. All I can tell you about the other chap is A, he had a gun, and B, he had a, um, a, a balaclava type thing on. Would I recognise him again? Yeah, because he looked straight at me. If I saw him, I would say, yeah, I can say that's definitely him. <laughs> Chrissy isn't having a problem describing faces because she can't remember them, but she has recalled one crucial detail for the investigation. But what I remember most significantly was a car travelling at great speed reversing. So I made sure that I had a good look at the car and the registration number. It was a saloon. I don't know what make because I don't know Audis very well. Do you want the registration number? Yes, please. Uh, November Golf, 58, and then it was uh, Victor X Ray Whiskey. <laughs> I was just concentrating on the car. Okay. But I've got to think about number plates anyway, strangely enough. You know, when, I, when cars go past me on the motorway, I you always can... put the number plate. I don't know why. Like... Yeah, Chrissy has given us some really fantastic detail about the car and given us a full registration number. It's very difficult, you know, when so much is going on around you and, and you know, when shotguns are being brandished around, whether or not you think it's for real or not, it's still quite horrendous. What do the witnesses recall about the getaway driver? The driver that got out um, and opened the back door, he was blonde, um, he had light coloured hair, and I think he had a little bit of stubble on his face as well. He looked very, you know, I mean, he looked just quite ordinary. I mean, nothing very distinctive about him. He's kind of a stockish, stockish belt bloke in his 30s, I would say. He was about a 5'8", you know, sort of pretty well-made bloke. 12 stone, 13 stone, 12 stone something. A squarish sort of face, like, you know, he looked to himself, kind of a, a ruddy complexion. Get in the car now! Move! 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 Let's go! Just sort of describe to me what you mean, ru ruddy. Something like that. Somebody who, he looked to me as if he was a bloke who was, spent a lot of time outdoors. Edward has given the fullest description of the driver so far. And as for those notes of Swathi's... I, I, I hope I didn't appear rude. No, that's fine. That's them. fine. Actually, I was thinking I should go through it now just to make well, sure that I didn't yes. miss out. And obviously, there's some questions I want to ask about the notes. 
she stated that notes were made on her own, so they would not been influenced by anybody else, and they were made about 30 minutes after the incident. So we're allowing her to refer to those notes now, see if there's anything there that she may have uh, omitted from the interview. I just drew this picture of, you know, where the people were. OK, this is a little different from what I said. Swathi realises her accounts are contradictory, but which one is correct? I'm saying here that um, man one's mask uh, came off. It said to you that it was man two. Now unsure of who did what, will Swathi be able to identify the suspects if she is put forward? Whilst the police only recommend witnesses to identify suspects who have a good chance of recognizing them, defense barristers rigorously defend the rights of their clients not to be recognized. I wouldn't allow you to go on an identification parade without certain preconditions. Firstly, I want to be given by the police the full description, not just the part of the statement that deals with the description. I want the statement or that section of the statement which deals with where you are supposedly taking part in the crimes and whether the witness is saying I'm in a position to identify because if they don't say that and it's only a general description I'm not putting you at risk of a false identification uh, and saying go on an identification parade. Okay based on the interview we're going to go forward to Viper with for the unmasked robber Andrew, Simon and Swarthy and for the driver Edward and Swarthy so let's see what that brings. Viper is one of a number of video identification parade systems being phased in across the UK to replace the traditional lineup now considered by psychologists to be unfair and flawed. With a live ID parade, the witness can see everyone in the parade at one time. That means they can make relative judgments about the faces. So they might pick the best of a bad bunch. Even if none of the people are a particularly good match, they'll pick the one that's the best match. With Viper, you only ever see one face at a time. They're presented sequentially. That should make Viper more accurate. It should lead to fewer misidentifications. The police now believe the two men they have in custody are the robber who was unmasked and the getaway driver. But without any supporting evidence, they need several positive identifications from our eyewitnesses. You never know how good a witness is going to be. I've had instances where witnesses have provided a superb detailed description of an individual. Arrests have been made, individuals have gone on lineups, the witness who you think is going to be a superb witness has gone to that lineup and not picked anybody out. So you never really know how good a witness is going to be. Having agreed to take part in the lineup, each suspect's face is matched with eight similar ones pulled from a database of over 27,000 volunteer images. Well, he's not bad. A bit less hair, but I'm happy with him, so I'll we'll choose him. Placed sequentially and identified only by a number, there is nothing to make any one particular face stand out, other than the witness recognising it. Following his full description of the unmasked robber, Will Andrew be able to identify him? Sit back a seat, please. I'm PC Bell. I'm doing the Ivan Dean parade today. OK. Um, so just watch the telly, please. Strict protocols are followed to ensure the witnesses aren't influenced. The lineup must be viewed twice. Then, if required, any numbers can be called up again. Number one and number three, I'd like to see again, please. Number one and three. Face, face. Was the person shown on the film? Uh, yes, um, number three. In order to confirm your identification, is this a person that you were referring to when you made the ID? Yes. Would I recognise him again? Yeah, if I saw him, I would say, yeah. I could say that's definitely him. I got quite a good, clear view of him. He actually looked straight at me. Is Simon still as confident? Was a person shown on the film? 
Yeah, I couldn't be sure. Can't be sure. No. Will Swarthy fare any better? I'm not 100% sure I could pick him up, but I think I may be able to recognize him. Can I look at one, two, and three again? One, two, and three, yeah. yeah. Was the person shown on the film? Yes, I think he was, and I think his number was three. When you said number three, did you yeah, mean that person? Yeah, yeah, I meant him. Yeah. Swarthy, like Andrew, has correctly identified the unmasked robber. But will her patchy recall of the driver prevent her from recognizing his face? He looked just quite ordinary. Arthur, you've seen that twice now. Do you see all or part of that again? I'd like to see number seven. Number seven. Was a person shown on the film? Yes, he was, um, and his number was seven. How is it possible to not be able to recall in detail what a face looks like, but be able to recognize it? Recall and recognition are two different cognitive processes that involve memory. Recall involves bringing the memory I have of someone's face into my mind's eye, imagining what it would look like. And I do that in order that I can then describe it to someone. I don't have a very good picture of this guy's face in my mind. Recognition involves us comparing a face that we see in front of us with our memory for faces and saying, is the face in front of me the same one that I have in memory, in which case I can recognize the person. Was a person shown on the film? Yes, he was. Of all the witnesses, Edward gave the fullest description of the driver. Oh, it was number six, like again. Was the person shown on the film? Can't make a buzzer out of that situation. Okay. But was unable to recognize him. While our witnesses were caught up in the robbery, Haley and Nick watched it from the safety of the studio. By eliminating the fear factor and weapon focus, we can explore other aspects of witness fallibility. Would repeatedly watching the crime on DVD make them overly confident to recall, recognize, and identify the suspects? By discussing what they see, as real witnesses often do, would they influence or contaminate each other's memories? He's got large quads. What's a quad? Uh, quadricep. Is that your thigh? Thigh, yeah. Yeah, he has got quite yeah, he's got, nice You can see it's defined there, isn't it, when he's tensed up? He's got quite nice thighs, thighs actually. <laughs> Contamination of witnesses, whether it's identification or not, is, is an obvious risk. You look at the language of the statement. Is this a statement that you think that that individual gave of, without any kind of assistance, either by other people or by police or whatever? And the way you do that is to see how it's phrased, the structure of the sentences, the phrases that are used. Sometimes similar descriptions of clothing are given then you begin to wonder whether, in fact, that idea has been planted in their minds quite unobtrusively, but it's there and unconscious. The police don't know that Haley and Nick watched the crime together repeatedly. Will they rumble them? Both witnesses give accurate accounts and detailed descriptions of the suspects, starting with the unmasked robber. Tight neck, curled, curly hair. Um, and it come down, it was quite an unusual shape in his head, actually. It was sort of like, it come down like a V here. He had a big V, kind of um, a V cut in the front of his head. Middle Eastern. Middle Eastern. Quite an Arab shaped nose. Large defined nose, large sideburns. Bushy, not, not bushy, but tight curly sideburns. I'm almost feeling I'm, I'm compelled to say that they were sort of bushy, but I don't know why I'd want to say that. Mm -hmm. i just stopped. The police interviewers have a fair idea. What happens in most cases where you've got more than one witness, their accounts will differ. And I would be more suspicious of an investigation where I've got witnesses all saying exactly the same and being able to retain and then recall exactly the same.
So you can see how that would have a question mark. How contaminated are their descriptions of the driver? He had a lot of wrinkles in his face. He's quite wrinkly. The police are now sure that Nick and Haley have discussed the crime. Were this case to be real, their evidence would be completely undermined. Should this proceed and go to court, the job of any defence team would simply be to look at the accounts obtained, look at any discrepancies, look at similarities, and one of the tactics they would use is say it's not a true account, that it's down to contamination. Although his quadricep muscles were quite defined. Quite defined, sort of, I don't know what that muscle is, but the, um, sort of, I don't know if that's the quads, but he had quite defined leg muscles, like he'd been worked, like he worked out. Having given such accurate descriptions of the suspects, they're both feeling optimistic. I'm about 85% confident I could recognise them. Was the person shown on the film? Yes. Haley's recognition confirms her recall. Um, can I see three and five again, please? Though he takes longer, Nick also makes a positive identification. Was the person shown on the film? Yes. What number? Five. On present form, recognising the unmasked robber should be easy. Can I look at number one and number six again? One and six? They give me the buff! Shit! My face! My face! You happy with that? Yeah. Okay. Was the person shown on the film? Yes. Number one. Yes. Um, could you just pause it on number two? Was the person shown on the film? Yes. What number? Number two. Okay, thank you. Is this the person that you're referring to when you made the ID? Yes. Thank you very much. Incredibly, having watched the DVD repeatedly and discuss the appearance of the unmasked robber at length. Both Nick and Haley have wrongly identified two innocent men. They have become overly confident witnesses, which can lead to wrongful convictions. What this shows you is that eyewitness memory is actually quite fragile, it's quite delicate. It's very easy to change it, to contaminate it, to make it inaccurate. Nevertheless, it's what the police have to deal with every time they interview an eyewitness. Before we show the police exactly what the witnesses saw, Mick and his team, with over 100 years of interviewing experience between them, cross-reference statements one final time. One of our witnesses has a very strong impression that one of the offenders is female. Liz has decided to get the phone out, and that offender is apt to act upon that and obviously restrain her to try and keep control of the situation. By working solely from eyewitness accounts and positive identifications, how close to the truth have they got? About two o'clock yesterday afternoon, we got a cash in transit delivery, PRP wholesale diamond merchants. We've got three offenders, all wearing masks, have approached the van and started to carry out the robbery. They've been stumbled across by a group of members of the public during the struggle, the mask of offender number three is removed by the security guard and his face is seen by the witnesses. And then Blizz has taken the phone out, phoned the emergency services, and it appears then that panic set in. Offender number one has fired a shotgun into the air and grabbed hold of Liz, trying to dissuade her from making the phone call. There's some suggestion that pliers are used to cut the chain or to the box is stolen. What appears to be the pre-planned escape vehicle, an OD in silver, the number November Golf 58, Victor X Ray Whiskey, screech around the corner. Liz has been bundled into the car by offender number one, driven away with Liz, and basically abandoned the car later on. The two offenders we have in custody is the driver and the person who had the mask removed. The police have pieced together a pretty accurate account of events and they spotted the planted contamination. But without any corroborative evidence to support Andrew's hunch, they failed to discover that one robber was a woman. A female. Yeah, a female, yeah. yeah. Definitely yeah. female, yeah. wasn't it? Yeah. mentioned combat, but yeah, female. Mm. It's been excellent being able to compare all the information I've got in my head from the witnesses and actually see what they saw. Yeah. 
and for me it's strikingly similar to, to the account I built up in my head. We were able to describe fairly accurately what occurred, so it shows that the system works. They've done a good job. The witnesses have given us the detail in order to allow us to charge these two individuals with some very serious offences, and without the help of the witnesses, we wouldn't be at this stage. The final task for our volunteers is to compare what they remembered seeing with what actually happened. At the time, it just comes past and I blur and I took nothing in. I went into detail for about five minutes about how the guy that was holding Liz was wearing sunglasses. And I even detailed the sunglasses. And I even described them with thin, thin metal rims. <laughs> we got to see it over and over and over again and really take it all in, and yet my account of it was inaccurate. Really inaccurate, considering. I didn't see the bloke have his mask whipped up. I don't know what I was doing. I was looking so I thinking so on. My mind must have been totally not there. Just not there at all. I think that I remember it, but quite often I'm actually not consciously making it up, but it's like my mind must just fill in the gaps. You can't rely on, on your mind. You think you know your own mind, mm. but it proves that you don't. It plays tricks with you. Yeah. Mm. For me, there's no such thing as a bad witness. Some witnesses come with a huge amount of information for you over an investigation. Others come almost apologetic by saying, I don't know whether it's important, with a little piece of information. That piece of information could be the one piece that cracks the case. Irrespective of how good our techniques are, we could not exist if it wasn't for witnesses. They're the lifeblood of investigators. Our ten volunteers have witnessed two violent crimes, become key witnesses in exhaustive police investigations, and have been debriefed for over 80 hours by Greater Manchester Police's elite interviewing team. If there's anything else you want... If you want like that. But most importantly, they have shown that while the police and courts require us to deal in certainties, our memories are by nature fragmentary. Perhaps then it's not surprising that eyewitness identification has been a main factor in both securing convictions. Number two. I'm pretty sure number two. And overturning them. You cannot eliminate miscarriages, whether based on identification or any other evidence, so you can't eliminate it. The most that any system can do is to put in place protocols and protections to marginalise and minimise the risk of a miscarriage based on identification. And in that way, you attempt to convict the guilty and acquit the innocent. Next time, how the police solve crimes when the only witness is also the victim. I'm terrified. And I'm just sitting there thinking, dear God, where have you brought me? But when poor police practice has devastating consequences. I'm here to tell you that eyewitnesses can make mistakes. And I am sorry. Several of our witnesses identified the wrong person. Do you think you could do better? To find out, go to bbc.co.uk slash eyewitness. And Eyewitness continues here on BBC4 tomorrow at 11.25. Next tonight, stay with us for a justice lecture from Harvard University with Michael Sandel. We get the reaction outside.